It is a tale of two Toronto City councillors, one who became mayor and one who watched a phenomenon sweep into City Hall only to see it crash and burn in spectacular fashion. John Fillion details former Mayor Rob Ford's meteoric rise and fall in his new book. It's called The Only Average Guy, Inside the Uncommon World of Rob Ford. And the Toronto City Councillor and author joins us now. Great to have you here at TVO. Thank you. I got to tell you, I've read, you know, I've read everything on this story. This is probably the most insightful thing I've read about Rob Ford. It's just a great book. You even take a shot at me, and I think it's a great book. Uh, <laughs> well, this was a tiny, tiny It was a tiny one. shot. Yeah, not as bad a shot as you took at Mansbridge. But anyway, uh, it's a terrific book. And I want to just read an excerpt here to get us off, off and rolling. Uh, here's from The Only Average Guy. Rob Ford showed the world many faces, all real, but none really him. He is a jumble of contradictions, attention seeker and shy loner, bully and kind-hearted friend a savvy politician who can't comprehend much of what happens around him, the self-proclaimed best mayor this city's ever had, and the guy with such low self-esteem that he'll stare at the floor to avoid eye contact. But the Rob Ford I know best is none of these. At some point, the 10-year-old inside him made friends with my 10-year-old self. We were sort of friends who didn't visit one another after school, but looked for each other at recess. Okay, fascinating. John, you, you sat a couple of seats away from him. What made you want to write a book about that relationship and him? Well, I just, I just found him so fascinating. He was like nobody I'd ever met before. And he would um, get up and give these incredibly angry outbursts. Like you thought he was literally going to explode. He'd get so red and, and, uh, and irate. And then he'd sit down and he'd just be in this sort of isolated bubble, like, he, you know, not connecting to anything or anyone around him. And I, I used to try to talk to him just, you know, to pass the time at council. And I thought, gee, it's really, really hard to even talk to this guy. And I just really became in, intrigued, um, intrigued by him and thought there must be some way to, to reach this person and relate to him as um, one human to another. And, uh, and I finally stumbled upon it through a, through a football bet. And uh, Tell us about that, because you guys bonded over football. Yes, which is um, football. You, you cannot um, overestimate how important football is in Rob Ford's life. It is, it may be the most important thing. If you'd said to him, would you rather be a football coach or mayor, I think he would pick football coach for sure. And um, it's this... Football is this world that he understands where he can be the expert, um, where he can, when he's a coach, where he can be his dad, sort of dispensing tough love. And he just feels very comfortable. He's, um, if he's sort of sitting there awkwardly and you, you bring up football, it's, you can just see this kind of relief, like finally something I can talk about. And, um, and then he'll expand from that to sort of take a step out into the real world, still related to football. Like he'll go, you know, how are your kids? Uh, do they play football? <laughs> um, but you can at least start talking about, you know, your kids, his kids in relation to football or hockey or... And he runs a weekly football pool, or at least he did anyway, at City Hall, yes? Yeah, he's running one now, yeah. I, I actually started one. I, I'm not even a... I don't. I know nothing about football. But um, you joined his football pool. Well, initially I started one to get to engage with Rob, and then uh, and then and then uh, after he became mayor, that sort of fell apart, and then he started his own, and then uh, wanted me to be part of that. And you guys, I mean, you've had a topsy turvy relationship with him at, at times good, at times he doesn't want to speak to you anymore, and yet you rebond over the pool, right? Even when he's mad at you, he says, "Have you got your picks in yet this week?" How do you figure that? He, well, he's only mad at me for about a, a month or two after I took his powers away. And um, he just, um, I don't know, it, it's, um, and this is something that's kind of sad about Rob, is that he doesn't, I don't think there are many people in his life who try to understand him or relate to him as a real person you know he's he's only of interest to them if he's the mayor or if he can do something for them if he can you know give them some money um, 
You know, it, it's um, so I think he actually kind of thought, here's a guy who's sort of interested in me, who kind of recognizes that 10 year old in me. Mm. And um, so there was this sort of um, warmth and people, you know, go, what are you talking about? I've never seen Rob Ford be express warmth to anybody. But, you know, we have um, w w um, with me, he's like a totally different kind of person. And uh, and you guys are nothing alike. Like, no, really nothing alike. Nothing in common at all, yeah. no. I mean, other than you're both on city council at the same time, but otherwise. Yeah, and we're not, I should make it clear, we're not best buddies like on the weekends or anything like that. Um, you ever socialize with him? No, well, just we, we'd go out for lunch the odd time. Okay, but did you ever get invited to his home in Etobicoke? No, no. no you ever never. go to a football game with him or a hockey game or anything I like that? I went to a hockey game with him, yeah, once uh, just last year uh, with uh, him and his son. and. Um, um, and it was after he was clean and straight. I know people who went to hockey games with him before that, it was a bit of a fiasco, but he was totally clean and um, and he was with his son. And again, I saw a whole other side of him. I saw somebody being a good dad, you know, and, and thinking, you know, maybe I haven't always been, but I'm, I'm going to be from now on because I don't know how long I'm going to be around and uh, I need to... You know, I need to be a good dad. That's really important to me. Mm -hmm. and, and just seeing him with his son was was really kind of touching. Let's do a few questions uh, to author here as opposed to city councillor in some respects. Uh, you rely heavily for this book on interviews with his former campaign director, Nick Kuvalis, Sheila Paxton, who worked in his office, his brother, Doug, who, again, despite looking at you as some heathen communist who can't possibly be trusted, talks to you very openly for this book. They are not friends of yours. They are you know, pretty much hostile to your agenda and you to theirs, but they talk to you openly. Why? Um, partly because everybody's got a story they want to tell. Um, Doug would be the only one who'd be sort of hostile towards me. Um, Nick and Sheila, Sheila would be you know, similar to me probably philosophically. And, Nick is, uh, you know, kind of misunderstood. Um, you know, he's not some right-wing nut. He's actually just a super bright, uh, pretty, pretty nice guy. Um, there, uh, John, there's lots of people I know who don't think Nick Kuvalis is a really nice guy. I, I know him a little bit. You know, came from the wrong side of the tracks in Windsor, and he's come a long, long way. He's impressive as hell, brilliant. But I haven't heard many people call him a nice, nice guy. With me, he's a nice, nice guy. Okay. Couldn't be nicer, incredibly generous with his time. Must have gave me like a dozen interviews, and he's a very busy guy. Yeah. And um, we were both fascinated by Rob, and, and um, um, the two of us, I would say, I'm not sure who understands Rob better than Nick and I, and the two of us would often talk about him and try to figure out, you know, what's... What's going on? Can we intervene? Can we help? Um, you know, what do you make of what just happened this past week? And um, so, you know, so Nick would just very readily tell, he likes telling stories and Doug likes telling stories. So uh, Doug would often start off saying, well, I'm only, I'm only, I only got five minutes. I'm, I'm very busy. And, and, and he'd start sort of spinning me usually for the first five or 10 minutes. And it'd be, you know, the Rotary Club and the, you know, the family's desire to help everybody in Etobicoke. Um, but then he'd get off on a story. He'd start talking about himself or his dad, um, you know, and then occasionally it'd wander into Rob, and then when he'd wander into Rob territory, I'd sort of explore that a bit. But uh, Doug likes telling stories, and he's a great storyteller, and um, so it's some of the best content in the book comes from, uh, from Doug's book. Absolutely. Uh, let me ask you one more question about sort of being the author of it. Cause you, that's your original background, right? You're not, you were not a lifelong politician. You used to be a journalist. I was a journalist, yeah, yeah. and okay. gave it up and didn't realize how much I missed it until I mm -hmm. started writing this book. Any concerns that you are kind of, some would say you're violating a kind of a, you know, a rule of omerta around the council chamber. All those kind of little off-the-record conversations that you guys have when the cameras aren't on and the mics aren't on, they're in the book. Have you violated any unofficial code down there? I don't think so, and I thought long and hard about that, and there's a whole lot of things that aren't in the book 
that were conversations. Which you'll tell me about after yeah. this is over. <laughs> yeah, um, so I had to think about it. Uh, Doug certainly, Doug knew I was writing a book, so when he, you know, when he said something, I figured he knows I'm writing a book, and um, in some cases he was kind of telling me something mm -hmm. because I was writing a book and was wanted to influence what was in the book, so I figured that was fair game. What about Rob, though? With Rob, um, again, he knew I was writing a book. What I had to think about with Rob was, did he really know what that means? So, um, as I say, there's, there's some things that I just didn't put in the book. Um, and I wouldn't have violated, um, um, if, so for example, if he invited me to the hockey game with his son as a friend, not as an author. So I didn't intend to write about that at all. But then I saw him being a good dad and I thought, you know, so that's not violating anything if I see him being a good dad. If I, if I had seen him being a bad dad, which I didn't, mm. I wouldn't have put that in. Hmm. Okay. Uh, I, I think one of the most fascinating takeaways I took from the book was the notion that you don't think Rob Ford really wanted deeply to be the mayor of this city. Uh, why did you come to that conclusion? Well, he didn't seem to like the job, uh, number one. Uh, he didn't un even understand what the job was. So He's, why did he run for it? He ran for it because to basically to please his mom and dad. Um, you know, his late father was somebody who he never gave any praise, was just about impossible to please. And... Um, um, the kids, especially, you know, Rob and Doug, desperately wanted to please their dad, wanted their dad's approval. And um, so I think Rob thought that was, you know, he couldn't please his dad with business success the way Doug had. So mm -hmm. his dad's other career was politics. So he thought, well, I'll follow my dad's footsteps there. Maybe I can make something of myself. But it wasn't because he understood the job or or wanted it and and once he had it um you know it was part of his undoing was he had this job he didn't know how to do hmm. uh it, we should remind everybody his dad was a mike harris mpp during the mm -hmm. 1995 to 99 That's progressive right. conservative government did his dad campaign for him well no interestingly enough and everybody thinks so oh, his dad was his big political mentor in fact, in his first campaign, which was 1997, um, a friend of Rob's told me that Rob was was sort of stunned when his dad told him that he'd voted for somebody else. Uh, in 2000... Let me get this straight. Rob Ford's dad, Doug, didn't vote for Rob when he had the chance. According to one of Rob's close friends, he voted for Dennis Flynn and told Rob that. And the, and the father told his son that? The father told his son that, which fits in with a lot of other things, like that Rob just couldn't, couldn't do anything to please him. And in 2000, um, people were talking to me about the Victory Party, and I said, oh, when, you know, what did his dad say? And they said, oh, his dad wasn't there. His and dad didn't show up to didn't Rob's show up Victory for his Party. Victory Party in 2000, and didn't show up again in 2003. So his son in 2000, his dad, fi his, Rob finally, you know, achieves some success in his life. He's been elected a city councillor, and his father doesn't show up to the victory party. Like how, how hurt must Rob have been? How devastating must that have been to him? And the father died before Rob became mayor, so never yes. got to see that. But one wonders whether that would have, you know, finally Rob gets to the top of the mountain, and would, would that have satisfied daddy? What do you think? Uh, I don't think so because, you know, Doug tells a story about going down to Chicago and starting up a very successful offshoot of Deco Labels in the U.S. and you'd think Dad would be proud as could be. Um, whether he was or not, he wouldn't tell his son that. Hmm. And you could, and you don't see, D uh, Doug never shows much um, that he's been hurt. You know, he's a pretty pretty tough nut. Thick skin but, guy. But on that one, when he was telling me about, you know, that his dad never said, good job, son, you could tell that that bothered him. Why do these boys, boys, excuse me, why, why, why do the sons of Doug Ford Sr., 
Why are they so desperate to impress a father who has demonstrated over and over again that he's just not going to give them what they want when it comes to recognizing their achievements? I don't know. I don't know because I've never experienced that. I didn't grow. I grew up in a, you know, the opposite kind of family where you got lots of attention and praise. So um, I, I don't. I guess you just keep. What, what you don't get, I guess you just keep needing. I remember when Rob was running for mayor, the first thing that would come out of his mouth when he did his stump speech on the hustings was, I am the son of Doug Ford, former Tory MPP. It's clearly a huge thing for him. Oh, it's a huge part of his identity. And, um, you know, the, the, um, um, he is so keen on customer service, which, you know, came from his dad and the, you know, calling people back up till midnight. Um, you know, that's you know, all, that's all from his dad. There's so much in Rob that's from his dad. So, is there? I, I well, to ask the question in some respects is to answer it. But is there part of you that feels uh, great sympathy for a guy who, despite all his problems, clearly has daddy issues that are utterly unresolved? I mean, that's there, oh, isn't it? Sure. You know, yeah. like I. Um, you know, he's a guy who's, um, you know, I think been hurting all his life. And, and, you know, people look at this, you know, big angry guy and they see the terrible behavior, um, all of which is real. I mean, his terrible behavior is real. And I, I should make it clear, I make no apologies for that. Mm-hmm. I don't dismiss it in any way. His, behavior was awful. He was not a good mayor, and that's an extreme understatement. But, you know, you have to separate that from the human being, and I have a a lot of compassion for somebody who's really had a terrible life. You write that, and I want to pick up on this notion that, you know, he got the mayor's job, and then he almost had no idea what to do when he had it, and in fact, the job overwhelmed him in some respects. Uh, beyond, you know, the substance abuse issues that he was dealing with, you write he was unable to recognize complexity in any form. He couldn't sit still or concentrate when you had meetings with stakeholders. He, d- okay, this is in the book, so I'm just quoting you. He didn't seem to know that he shouldn't be talking about his sweaty balls in meetings and would kind of adjust himself in front of other people, women included. Uh, you know, could you describe a bit about his capacity to understand what was going on in that job? Um, well, Rob, and I, and I don't mean this in an unkind way at all, but Rob can only comprehend a few subject areas. Um, football, politics, but politics in, in a, you know, my team versus your team football-like way. Um, and a few property standards kinds of issues that he's made himself an expert on from going and knocking on people's doors, how to, you know, how to get their fridge fixed or how to deal with the mold in their, in their apartments. He's kind of an expert on um, a very small number of things and anything outside of that, he like literally has no comprehension of. And people think, oh, you're exaggerating or something, but uh, you, you really cannot talk to Rob about much other than those very small subject matters. So, you know, to be mayor and to be expected to understand very complex issues in order to, you know, try to solve them uh, was just completely impossible for him. Let me go back to Nick Kovalis, who's the guy who uh, saw a candidate that he thought could win and decided to sign on with Rob Ford and, and did his job extremely well, got, helped get Rob Ford elected mayor. There's a point in the book where you tell a story of Rob Ford and Doug Ford who are going to go meet former Premier Mike Harris at Harris's office. And Nick wants to tag along. And the Ford brothers say, forget it, you're not coming. And Nick says, I'm coming. Pick up the story. Uh, well, the, yes, and so the three of them are heading off to see Mike Harris. It's Doug who really didn't want Nick there. Rob didn't care so much. Okay. Um, and Rob has been running as the anti-establishment, anti-elite candidate. He's been shunned by, by all of the conservative establishment. All of a sudden, it's August uh, 2014, 
um, and um, the polls are showing, uh, you know, this guy's going to win, and all of a sudden the conservative party hierarchy, according to Nick, um, are, you know, frantically trying to ingratiate themselves to the, the, the guy who they think is going to be mayor. So um, um, Doug's off to meet um, Mike Harris, who's going to offer to raise money for them because they're, they're in the hole. And um, um, Nick Cavallis is dead set against it because he doesn't want Rob or the campaign to be in any way associated with the party establishment and the elite and people who are you know, um, sucking up to Rob at, at the last minute. So um, Kuvalis basically sabotages the uh, efforts by Mike Harris to, um, to step in and raise, um, um, raise a quarter of a million dollars for Rob's campaign. What, what does he say to Mike Harris? He says to Mike Harris, we, we don't want to have anything to do with uh, anybody like you. Our whole campaign has been based on fighting people like you, you're going to stay the heck away from us. Uh, he didn't say the heck. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's, well, Started didn't want to get bleeped. Started uh, with an F, I think. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, during the campaign and after the campaign, we'll let you raise three quarters of a million for us. What did the Premier say to that? The Premier said, who the F are you? <laughs> and he said, uh, my name's uh, Nick and I'm a great fan of yours from... Uh, um, from your days as premier, but you will stay um, the F away from this campaign. And he did. Nick got his way on this, eh? Yeah, Nick got his way on a lot of stuff. And, um, you know, and, and Nick was right. That was part of Rob's appeal hmm. was that he was the anti-establishment guy. He was the anti-politician hmm. politician. And this is in the lead up to the 2010 election that Ford ends up winning. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did you talk to Mike Harris about that incident? No, I didn't. Uh, I didn't talk to Harris. <laughs> I bet he doesn't think Nick Kuvalis is nice, nice. I'm just saying. Anyway, moving on. Did Rob Ford ask to vet your book in any way, to read an advance copy, to fact check, anything like that? No, quite the opposite. I I uh, I tried multiple times to interview Rob, and he was like, "Nah, buddy, I don't read. Uh, I don't read that stuff. People write about me. It's okay. Write whatever you want." And I kept saying to him, no, no, you, I'm, I'm not writing the normal kind of book, Rob. Like, you, you, really should, you really should talk to me. And no, no, buddy, you know. And then I, sa I said to him, would you like me to read you? I'd like to read you the prologue. And, um, and he said, nah, nah, that's OK, buddy. And then even after the book was, um, was finished, I said, can I give you a copy? And he was, no. That's okay. I wouldn't read it. So it's all right, buddy. But I hope to sell a million copies. So he hasn't read it. Hasn't read it. How about Doug? I don't know if Doug has read it. Um, and I, it's hard to predict Doug's reaction because, um, you know, you you might think Doug wouldn't like it, but he's quoted extensively. He gets to tell his version of things mm. um, and kind of explain things, explain the world as he sees it. And, um, um, and I do point out that I do, I do think he's a, a brilliant, uh, brilliantly manipulative um, communicator. <laughs> we got a couple of minutes left here and I want to touch on two more things. One is the fascinating relationship between these two brothers. They clearly love each other. They clearly try to have each other's back. They also clearly are deeply rivalrous of each other as well. Did you, did you figure out why that was? Well, their their deep bond um, is based totally on bloodlines. You know, they're they're bonded together by the the family name, and uh, they were brought up that you know that if you anybody goes after a Ford, you you go beat the crap out of them, and the Fords, you know, stick together against the outside world. Um, but having said all that, there's no real warmth and compassion, uh, you know, between them. The, they don't have a real normal brotherly relationship, and uh, it's very competitive. Um, 
and and um, in in some ways, you know, Doug is was jealous of Rob being mayor, and um, you know, kind of would, un would undermine him at every opportunity. Would undermine him at every opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, um, the I mean, the greatest example was that um, uh, cut the waste challenge, where he talked Rob into having a competition. The two of them having a competition on who would lose the uh, most weight, the guy who, you know, works out every day and is full of confidence and self-discipline, or the guy with uh, low self-esteem who has an eating problem and uh, very little willpower. So, you know, you know how that's going to end, and Doug certainly knew how it was going to end before he started it and uh, just kind of reveled in it. You once suggested to Rob Ford that he was like a Rorschach test for people, right? Did you draw any conclusions about the psyche of the people of Toronto in terms of their reaction to the Fords? Yes, it's, it's very interesting that the people have this remarkably emotional reaction to Rob Ford. They, they don't say, oh, I disliked his policy on on this or that, I don't like the way he voted, you know, philosophically, they'll just go, he's an awful bad man. He's, or he's a, a good man, he's our champion, he's our hero. Everybody um, just had this very visceral reaction to him based in large part, not, not just on their values, but with an awful lot of people based on uh, what they grew up with. Did they have abuse in their family? Did they have violence in their family? Um, did they grow up with people who lied a lot and they would react to Rob Ford based on that, their impression of him based on that? They would, they would put their own personal experiences onto him. They connect over family dysfunction. They connect over family dysfunction and they, um, they in some cases, they like hate Rob Ford. In some cases, they love him with no rational basis. And in other cases, they hate him. And uh, in one point, uh, Rob says to me, well, why do people hate me? This is, again, when he's clean. You know, he wouldn't have asked me that when he was on crack. You know, why do people hate me? And I said, ah, oh, Rob, you know, people hate me too. He goes, no, no, they don't, they, don't, they don't hate you. They might dislike you. They really hate me. You know, why is that? And I said, have you ever heard of a Rorschach test? And he said, no. And I said, it's just ink blots on a piece of paper and a psychologist will hold it up. And what people see has nothing to do with the ink blots. It has to do with them. And you're like, uh, you're like the ink blots. And he kind of said, yeah, I kind of I kind of see what you mean. I kind of get it. Yeah. Hmm. Let's finish on this, John. I take no joy in asking the question this way, but it has to be asked this way. Rob Ford wants to run for mayor again in 2018. If he lives, if he lives, what would you advise him on that score? Um, gee, um, I would probably say don't do it. Um, but um, I mean, he wouldn't listen to that. He wouldn't ask me for advice on that. He would, um, he would just feel he needs to be vindicated. Uh, political contest to him, or like a football game, you get, you get tackled and you get up and there's another play. So he would just be. The, there's no question he will run again if he's well enough to uh, do it. And if he's not, does Doug go? Yeah. Doug goes instead. Yep. The book is called The Only Average Guy, Inside the Uncommon World of Rob Ford, which I think we all understand a lot better now. You're having written this book, John Fillion. Thanks for visiting us at TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.